Hey, we're in the middle of a series we've been going on since pretty much the first Sunday of February. We've been talking about renewing the mind. And I don't want to recap it all. Go on our YouTube channel and you can catch up to where we're at. Last week, we started to talk a bit more about renewing our mind uh, when it comes to the things that culture is screaming at us. And renewing your mind takes effort. Paul says in Romans 12, he says, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. To be conformed means... It's easy. You just don't have to do anything. You're marinating in a culture right now. You're marinating in thoughts and ideologies and ethics. We're just marinating in it, and it's all around us. And to be conformed to the world, we've just got to sit back and do nothing. But if we're going to be transformed, it says we've got to be transformed, then that's going to take a little bit of deliberate effort on our part. That means we're going to have to take some of the ideologies and the things that we hear in culture, and we're going to have to line them up with the Word of God and go, okay, what does the Word of God say? about this? What does the Word of God say about these current issues and things that are going on? So that's what we're doing at the moment is we're kind of looking at some of the stuff that's happening in culture and we're trying to line it up and go, okay, let's come back to the Word of God. How many of you know it's easy to drift away? It's easy to drift away, especially when culture is saying it's safer over here. It's safer over here. If you agree with this and you think this way, there are a lot of benefits nowadays so when Christianity first got off the ground, um, um, Christianity eventually became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Right? Now, that doesn't mean that every person that, be, that called themselves a Christian actually had a heart connection to God through the person of Jesus. What they recognized in Roman society back then was there were a lot of benefits to being a Christian. Christians cared for the poor. So if you're a poor person and you link yourself to the church, you get cared for. Out in society, you were destitute. Christians cared for the sick, the downtrodden. Christians uh, elevated the status of women. Christians fought for equality. Um, there was a whole bunch of things that Christianity offered. So when, when we hear in the history books that Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, it just became the official religion. It doesn't mean that every person that linked, it, linked themselves to Christianity did it for the right reasons. There were benefits, right? And I think that it's kind of almost reversed in the world today. The benefits come now if we disassociate ourselves from Christianity, there are benefits. Amen? It's, it's easier. It's easier to get somewhere in life if you just disregard God or go underground with your faith or just compromise on this and compromise on that. And that's the day and the age that we're living in. And I think, to be brutally honest, I think we've done enough of that. And I think it's time that we stop doing that. And that doesn't mean that it's easy. So we've been talking about some of that stuff. Last week, we looked at the, a biblical definition of marriage. We looked at the topic of marriage. We looked at how it's defined by the laws of the land, and we also looked at how it's defined within the pages of the Bible. We landed on a biblical definition of marriage as being the union of two people of the opposite biological sex voluntarily entered into for life to the exclusion of all others. I'm not going to go through it all this week. You can go back and watch on YouTube and look at that. But basically, this pre I presented this conclusion based on the following factors. Number one, because marriage is a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. If you go back and look at Ephesians 5, verse 22 to 32, it'll show you this, that marriage is a picture down here on earth of the relationship between Christ and the church. Number two, because marriage is God's ordained method of fulfilling the first command he ever gave to mankind. Genesis 1, 27, 28. He said, be fruitful and multiply. You cannot do that, two people of the same biological sex. It's impossible to do that. So that's the second reason. And the third reason was because same-sex sexual relationships are condemned in the Bible. The only accepted sexual relationship from a Judeo-Christian perspective is that which takes place within the covenant of marriage between two people of the opposite biological sex. Now, I made a, a, a statement last week that there are, there are ancient texts out there 500 years before Christ came and 500 years after Christ came, that, that every ancient text that has been discovered uh, condemns same-sex sexual relationships. Let me clarify, I didn't clarify that well, within the Judeo-Christian worldview and writings. Outside of Christianity, there was all kinds of things going on, very much like today. Things that we think today are, uh, 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 would curl your toes. There was that and more going on back in ancient cultures. But 500 years before Christ, up to 500 years after Christ, every written document that we found of, uh, written within a Judeo-Christian worldview, same-sex sexual relationships are condemned. They're condemned. You might not like it, I might not like it. But my decision when I was 19 was to follow Jesus. And that means going with him. When me and him don't agree, I choose I've got to go along with him. Why? Because he's the Lord, I'm not. And if I don't want to go along with him and I want to just go along with me, then I've basically replaced one Lord with another Lord. And I'm making myself Lord. And that's the reality of Christianity. When we gave our lives to Jesus, we gave our lives to him. Not just a bit of us. Not just our heart. Not just this, not just that. We gave our lives to him. We gave our future to him. 
and we submit ourselves under what he teaches. Now, this third point, while helping us define a biblical definition of marriage, it also provides us with an insight into the question of same-sex sexual relationships. According to what we have written in these ancient documents, are same-sex sexual relationships approved by God, or are they condemned? And according to my reading of Scripture, the Bible condemns same-sex sexual relationships as wrong. And it's not just in the Old Testament. Romans chapter 1, verse 26 to 27. Now, Romans chapter 1, I'll explain a little bit of this in a second. 26, 27, it says, Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men. Now, now, now let me give you a bit of clarity on, and context on this. Romans chapter 1, Paul's actually writing about Gentiles. He's writing about the Gentile world. This is, this is how the Gentile world operates, right? And then in Romans chapter 2 and 3, he then turns on the Jews. And he goes, but hey, you Jews, you sinners too. Okay? And if you go and read the context, he then unpacks, uh, uh, unpacks it from a Jewish perspective. And he actually lands where he wants to land in uh, 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 chapter 3, verse 23 to 24. I've got that up there, 23 to 24. You got that one there? Yep. So Romans chapter 1, he talks about Gentiles, you, how far removed they are from God. They've got no interest in God. They're, shamed, they're, they're carrying on like this. Then he goes, but you Jews, you can't judge and criticize because you Jews have moved away from God as well. And then he lands and summarizes it there. He says, for all have sinned. Jew, Gentile, all of us. He says, for all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all of us, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. All of us are justified by the same grace. Amen. So he's not necessarily just having a go on a particular individual, but he's talking about some of the activities and so on that went on within that context in the Gentile world. But here's what he says. He makes it very, very clear. He says that, uh, that some sexual relationships, he calls them unnatural. He says they're unnatural. He mentions natural relationships. That word natural in the Greek means produced by nature, agreeable to nature and governed by nature. He says that, that there's natural sexual relationships, but he also says there is unnatural sexual practice as well. And he points that out in Romans, that there is something that is natural when it comes to, to, to the union of, of, of the sexual union and activity, but he says there's something that's unnatural. And when he speaks of unnatural, he speaks of two people of the same biological sex engaging in sexual activity. We also see this in Paul's letter to Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 to 10, Paul writes this to Timothy. He says, We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels. If you go to one of, I think it might be in Galatians, Paul writes this. He says, I wouldn't know what sin was apart from the law. In other words, the law law shows me what right and wrong is. This is the point that he's making here. He says, But we know that the law is not made for righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels. He goes on, The ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral... For those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. Now, here's the thing. Whatever Paul meant by sound doctrine, it's clear that practicing homosexuality did not fit in with it. Neither did other forms of sexual immorality. Neither did lying, by the way. Okay? Neither did lying. There's a whole bunch of other things that are mentioned there. But it's very clear that uh, from those two passages in the New Testament that there is a natural uh, uh, type of sexual relationship and there is an unnatural one. And the unnatural one is termed and written down by Paul as being that between two people of the same biological sex. And it's very clear here as well that Paul's saying to Timothy, there is a collection of sound doctrine. This early in the church's existence, there is a collection of sound doctrine, which means right teachings. There's a collection of right teachings and practicing homosexuality is outside the bounds of what the New Testament teaches as right teachings. It's outside the boundaries of that. Now, that's the truth. Amen? That's the truth. But our call as a church is not simply to run around defending truth and run around winning arguments. It's to point people to the one who is the truth, to Jesus, so that they too can know the truth and be empowered to walk in the truth. Jesus didn't die to establish a truth. He died to bring people back into relationship with the Father. And he commissioned his church not to go out there and defend truth, but to take the message of reconciliation and to make it known to the world around us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 20, Paul writes this to the Corinthian church. He says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
And then he explains what that ministry of reconciliation is. He says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us. Who's us? He's writing to Christians. It's the church. He says, God has committed to us, the church, the message of reconciliation. See, sometimes it's disappointing when the church is more known for what we're against than what we're for. And unfortunately, we've done a really, really poor job of telling the world, this is what we believe, this is what we are for. And when we get too caught up and bogged down in cultural stuff, the, the, the negative side of that is that when we, then we feel like our job is to run around now in this time and season and defend truth and uphold truth. I think we need to stand for truth. The best way you can defend truth is live it. The best way you can defend the truth of God is live as a Christian. Live your life. Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. He says, he's committed to us the, ministry, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So our message first and foremost to a culture that's going to hell in a handbasket is be reconciled to God, not clean yourself up. Our primary message has to be that there's a God in heaven that loves you. You're a sinner. The only way you can be reconciled to God is to lay down your life, accept that what Jesus did on the cross was for you, and come back into relationship with the Father through Jesus. That's, that's the message of the gospel, no matter what your sin is. And you know what? There are certain sins, and I'll be brutally honest with you, there are certain sins I don't understand, and they disgust me. They disgust me because I don't understand it. And here's the thing. I don't understand it because it's never been a problem for me. I've never had to deal with things like this. I've never, I've never battled what it feels like to be same-sex attracted. I've never battled what it may feel like to think that I'm a male, but I'm in a different... I haven't had to battle that and experience that on a daily basis. It's easy for me just to judge it as some abstract thing out there that somebody else struggles with. And we've all got that in our life. We've all got that. There are things that you struggle with that you can relate to. And you have great compassion and empathy for people that maybe struggle with that or go through that stuff. Yet it's hard for you to relate to somebody else that's done something outside of that. Because it's not your experience. And sometimes we can be a little cold and judgmental. Well, because I don't struggle with that, nobody should. Well, hang on, I've got a certain background, a certain upbringing, a certain way of looking at the world. I have certain pains in my background, certain disappointments, certain hurts. No two people are exactly the same. No two people are exactly the same. And here's the thing. Same-sex attraction is not an issue the church has to deal with. It's a challenge a lot of people have to live with. And if all we care about is proving our point to society, then I believe we do the gospel and the blood of Jesus a great disservice. So here's what I want to do for the rest of our time this morning. I want to leave you with some thoughts today that will hopefully add grace to the truth we've been talking about. Let me be very, very clear before I start. Are same-sex sexual relationships allowable in the eyes of God? In my opinion, no. They are prohibited. They're prohibited. Let me be very clear about that as I move on to what I want to talk about now. I want to give you some points of grace that we can line up with the points of truth that we've looked at. I'll go through this really, really quickly. By the way, can I also say this? Last week, I was so encouraged after the service. I was encouraged by the questions that people asked. I was really, really encouraged. From the minute the service finished, I had some people coming up and talking and asking questions. And, 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 and here's, here's what I was impressed with. It tells me something, that, that, that we're a people that want to think about these things. And that's what, I'm, that, that's what I want about this, renewing your mind. I want you to start thinking. It's one thing to say, I believe this, but why do you believe it? Why do you believe it? Why do you believe it? I want my beliefs to be rooted in Scripture. I want my beliefs to be rooted firmly in who Christ is and what Christ taught. And I want to be able to explain that to people who have genuine questions, people who have genuine struggles. I want to be able to point them to the Word of God. I want to be able to say, this is why. It's, it's not, I, don't even, I don't even want to believe half the stuff in the Bible. If I'm brutally honest, there's a, a, there's a part of me that just wants license to just throw off all the railway tracks and just leave wherever I want. Because there's still this sinful part, this human nature inside of us that pulls us in these directions. I mean, God comes along and goes, well, hang on, broad is the road that leads to destruction and many are going to find it, but narrow is the road that leads to life. I go, that sucks. 
because I, I've got, I, know, I know I'm going to stay on the narrow road, but gee, I'd love to dip my toes in the broad one. Every now and then, just dive it, you know? Ah! And this is the tension that we live with as Christians. But I want to give you three things to think about, three bits of truth. We've got truth, but I want to tie a bit of grace into that. Is that okay this morning? So everybody's very clear. I just don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not saying, okay, I'm saying very clearly, same sex, sexual relationships are wrong. But here's the thing. Number one, the truth is change is possible. But grace understands that it's not guaranteed. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 11. Here's what Paul writes to the Corinthian church. Now, if you know anything about the Corinthian church, they were messed up. Go and read some of the stuff Paul's dealing with in the Corinthian church. There is some messed up stuff. At the same time, though, they've got the Holy Spirit flying around and spiritual gifts and everything kind of happening, you know? It's weird. I don't quite get it. But they were a messed up bunch of people. But Paul writes this to this messed up bunch of people that had come to faith in Christ. He says, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Everyone say some of you. Some of you were. Isn't that amazing? But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Some, so were some of you. There were people in Corinth, in the gathering in the church, that had been set free from the power of same-sex attraction. Some people will say that if it's there, it's there for life, you can't be set free. I don't see that. I see Paul right into the Corinthians going, hey, so were some of you. Some of you guys were each of these things in the list that I'm mentioning, but guess what? You were set free. So if you're a person that struggles with same-sex attraction, freedom is possible. Freedom is possible. Don't believe the lie that this is something I struggle with and I can never break free of it. That, That is a lie. To say that you can never break free of something like that, that is a lie. To say that, 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 that you're a same-sex attracted person and the compulsion to have to act on that is just, it's just the way God made me and I can't change it, that is a lie. And if you want to know, here he is 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, Paul's writing to a group of people. Some of them came out of that struggle, out of that sin, and Paul's saying some of you were. So some of you were set free from that. Sometimes we think there are certain things that God can't touch and God can't change. And it's not true. It's not true. It's not true. Some of you were. People in the gathering had been set free from the power of same-sex attraction. Now, how did it happen? Well, here's the thing. Paul didn't tell us how it happened. But it should provide hope to all that no matter what desire we're struggling with, no matter what desire we are struggling with, it is possible to break its influence over your life through the power of the cross and the presence of the Holy Spirit. You might not be sitting here today same-sex attracted. Maybe, maybe you have another thing going on in your world. Maybe there's something else that you're struggling with. Well, the good news here is so were some of you. So were some of you. You can be set free from the power of those things in your life. It's possible. Even in 2024, God is still doing miracles. And God is still loving people. And the power of God is still present to break chains and open prison doors. That's the truth. That's what the church believes. And if not, that's what the church should believe. Because there is no use-by date on the power of God. You can go right through the New Testament. I've done it. You cannot find a use-by date. Anywhere there where God says, this is the cutoff. I don't do miracles anymore. I don't change human hearts anymore. He still does. He still does. That's the biblical truth. So what are some of the possible ways that this could have happened? Well, we don't know. But maybe they were supernaturally set free of that same-sex desire. Maybe they were. I've shared the story here before about a good friend of mine. She had a whole bunch of stuff going on inside of, of, of her heart and she'd been uh, messed up as a child and uh, raised in a, not a great way and she had all emotional baggage and stuff and um, while she never came out and said that she struggled with same-sex attraction, she had, had appearances and so on that that could be something that she kept bottled down. We'll talk about this in a minute. But I watched her in a worship service in a tent standing, right? I'm standing here worshiping and she's on, there's an aisle there. She's over there, three chairs behind or two, two rows back, standing with her hands in the air. I don't know why I did it during worship. I looked. Something picked her up, literally picked her up through her three rows of chairs, backwards over the chairs. She landed with the small of her back on the top of a chair like that, bent like a pretzel. I thought she broke her back. Flung forward, bang, landed face first in some mud because we were in a tent outside in, in, in the southern suburb of Brisbane at the time. Hit the ground, burst into uncontrollable laughter and in a moment was set free of all of that stuff. And I know that because I went to India with that girl and we continued to be in, in, in a, like a, a relationship as in working together for some time after and she was transformed and changed in a moment by the supernatural power of God. 
It makes me angry because I'm still carrying emotional baggage and God wants me to talk to people about it. Just throw me over a chair, Lord. I don't want to talk to people about it. Just <laughs> hurl me over a chair. Just do that and set me free, would you? But he doesn't do that for everybody, but he can do it. I mean, he can do it. Maybe, maybe they were under the influence of demonic spirits and they received a deliverance. Now, I'm not saying that every same-sex attracted person has a demonic spirit. I'm not saying that. I'm saying maybe it could be. I mean, the Bible gives us instances where sicknesses were attributed to demonic spirits. Amen? Not every sickness was attributed to a demonic spirit, but some were. We've got situations in the New Testament where mental illness was attributed to a demonic spirit. Not every mental illness is a demonic spirit, but some were. So is it possible that same-sex attraction, this desire, could have some kind of demonic connotation or spirit attached to it? It's possible, yes. But here's the thing. We don't want to read more into the text than what Paul actually tells us. So we actually don't know how these people were set free, but we do know that they were set free. And as a church, that should give us great hope. It should give us great hope when it comes to ministering to people that are struggling with this. And if you're sitting here today, and here's the thing. You could be sitting here in this church right now and be struggling with this. That's a very, very real possibility. You could be sitting here struggling with same-sex attraction. You could even be sitting here today and be somebody that not only struggles with same-sex attraction, but you have turned that into an action. You could be sitting here today. If you are, I'm glad you're here. I want to say to you that there is hope in Jesus. There is hope in Jesus. There's hope in Jesus. But even though Paul says some people in the Corinthian church had been able to walk away from same-sex activity, we cannot assume that all those struggling were. Again, we don't want to read into the text. Could there have been people still sitting in the church struggling with that? It's quite possible. Paul didn't say every single person that struggled with this was set free yet. So we can't read too much into it. Don't assume that everybody struggling was set free. We know enough about the Corinthian church to know that there was still a fair bit of sin being carried out by its members. Some people will continue to struggle with same-sex attraction in the same way that many of us in this room here still struggle with other things that the Bible calls sin. Why do we think that that one thing is that God would single that out and make sure everybody's free of that, but yet he still, you still struggle with lying? You still struggle with gossip? You still struggle with loving your wife or loving your husband? You still struggle with impatience? We still struggle with, with, with some people drink too much. Some pe- but why would we assume that, that everybody... With it, that, Sin is sin. God is God. He loves us all and he works with us all. However, as believers, we do understand that God will always support us in our decision to say no to whatever desire, whatever temptation we have. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us, No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. I love this. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Every time I'm tempted in something, I know this. If I give in to that temptation, I'm not going to blame God. Because I know that he didn't, let me, he didn't let that temptation go too far. I added a couple of steps to it. I'll take responsibility for that, Lord. I added a couple of steps to that. Because God, you're not letting me tempt, be tempted beyond what I can bear. That's your promise. Not only that, to back it up, he says, but when you are tempted, he'll also provide a way out. So not only is God tempting me too far, allowing me to get tempted too far into something, and then leaving me on my own, he's saying, I will not let you be tempted beyond what I believe as your heavenly Father that you can handle. See, sometimes God has greater faith in us than we do in ourselves. God sees greater strength in us than we see in ourselves. God's going, you don't have to give in to that. I know you, don't. I know you did, but you don't have to. Because I didn't let you get tempted beyond what you could bear. And in that moment, I always provided a way out for you too. Something happened around that. I, I, I tried to pull you out of that. So when I go too far with those desires and I, I step across that line, I, I don't, I don't, I'll take responsibility and go, God, I added a couple of steps to that because you would not let me be tempted beyond what I'm capable of handling. That's the promise of God. Now, that's the good news. God doesn't call us to walk in ways that are impossible for us to walk. No matter how strong the desire in Christ, we can overcome. Now, the second thing I want to say to build onto that, the truth is obedience is necessary. Amen? As followers of Christ, the truth is obedience to Christ is necessary. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say? In other words, if you do not do the things I say, how can you really call me Lord, Lord? The two don't go together. So the truth is, obedience is necessary, but grace understands it's not necessarily easy. It's not necessarily easy. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19, Peter says this. He says, So then, those who suffer according to God's will. Can you see that there? 
There are people who suffer according to God's will. As, as a Pentecostal church, we don't have a great uh, uh, theology of suffering. What do we do when suffering comes? Our first port of call, oh God, take it away. God, get rid of it. Suffering is the devil. Suffering is a bad thing. Yet right throughout the New Testament, we see that there are redemptive aspects to suffering and going through things. He says, so those who suffer according to God's will should what? Commit themselves to their faithful creator and what? Continue to do good. In the midst of suffering, in the midst of suffering, and the context, the picture he's painting here is that you're doing good because of the good you're doing, you're suffering. He's saying, don't back down, just keep doing good. Commit yourself to God and keep doing that which is good. We don't like to talk about suffering, but the Bible talks about it a lot. And it can mean a lot of different things to different people. Suffering it can be a lack of food. Some people say, I'm suffering with a lack of food. For somebody else, I'm just, I didn't have a coffee this morning, I'm suffering. <laughs> no, no, if you didn't have a coffee, the people around you are probably suffering. <laughs> but here, Peter provides us with a definition of what it means to suffer according to God's will. And here's what I believe it means to suffer according to God's will. Where have we got? You want to whack that slide up for me? Suffering according to God's will means this, the undesired consequences we experience as a result of faithfully committing to follow Jesus. The undesired consequences, because we don't want them, that's why it's called suffering. The undesired consequences we experience as a result of faithfully committing to follow Jesus. Who's faithfully committed to follow Jesus with their life in this room? Then let me tell you something. Guess what? I'm going to promise you something. There's going to be some suffering coming your way. Yay, hallelujah. Who wants to get saved? Come to Jesus. You can suffer with us. So this is what Peter's saying. He's saying when you are experiencing those undesired consequences that come from faithfully following Jesus, commit yourself into the hands of God and continue to do what you know you need to do. Now there's two ways that we suffer. There's the external suffering that comes from obedience to Christ. You may lose your job. You may lose a friendship or a family member breakdown of relationship. You may get overlooked for a promotion. You may not get picked on that sporting team. You may not get a seat at the table. Your voice might not be heard. In India, you might not be able to drink at the community water hole. You might not be able to wash your clothes by the stream with the rest of the Hindu ladies. But there's also an internal suffering as well. And that internal suffering is the, d- the denial of those desires that are not in line with the way God calls us to live. There's an internal suffering. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 to 6. I don't have to tell you this, but who was Colossians written to? A bunch of Christians. 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 It's easy to say to the world out there. He's not writing to the world out there. He's writing to you and me. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed which is idolatry, put to death. That's suffering. Because I've got this desire that's saying, I want to go over here and do this. But I know Christ is saying, no, it's not right. So I've got to put that desire to death. I've got to walk against, operate against that desire in me. That's not easy. That's not easy. That's not easy to do. To 1 Peter 2.11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. You've got desires in you that wage war against your soul. And Paul, uh, Peter writes and he says, I'm urging you to abstain from those desires. They're real. They're there. They're inside of us. And he's saying, you've got to, as a good faithful follower of Christ, there are some things you've just got to say no to. And there's a suffering in that. There's a suffering in that because it doesn't feel good because your feeling wants that. But for the sake of Christ and following Christ, I've got to say no to some of these desires. So here's the thing. Desire in and of itself is not a sin. It's what you do with it that makes it sinful. James explains this best. James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15. Watch what James says. He says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Watch this. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. He says that desire and sin are two separate things. But he says that sin begins with desire. 
And if you don't put to death that desire, but you act on that desire, he said, then you move into the realm of sin. The desire itself is not sin. Desire is not sin. We have stuff inside of us. We, we all have different backgrounds. We, we, have, we have different passions. We're made different ways. We've seen and experienced different things in life. I feel sorry for this younger generation. We live in an overly sexualized world, and they are exposed to things way before they should be. The Song of Solomon, three times, three times Solomon writes this line. He says, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Until it so desires. He says there's a time. There's a time for that desire to be aroused and awakened inside of a human. And we've got a young generation that cannot even go to Coles or Woolworths without having naked women on posters. They can't turn on TV without being told things of a sexual nature. They pick up books these days and it's all in their face. And it's awakening stuff in them. And they're having to battle with this stuff from this high. And it's wrong. It's wrong. And I pray for the kids. I genuinely have a heart for the next generation. I pray everything we are doing now, it's not for us. It's for that generation of kids. It's for them when they grow up. I want them to grow up knowing what the Word of God says about some of this stuff. I want them growing up knowing that it might be tough to be a Christian, but it's right because Jesus loves you. I want them to grow up knowing that, yes, if you say no to certain things, you know, it may limit your opportunities. It may cost you a lot, but it's worth it because we don't live for glory down here. We live for glory up there. We don't live for crowns down here and promotions down here and money down here and everyone loving us down here and likes on Facebook and Twitface and all the other things out there. We don't live for that. We live to stand before one person one day and have him say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we live for. So James separates the two. He says there's desire and there's sin. If I was to ask you today, what's your own evil desire? What's that evil desire inside of you? Because James says that that evil desire, if you, if you act on that desire, it'll conceive. It'll give birth to sin. If you lay with that desire long enough, it'll turn into a baby. And that baby's name is sin. This is what he's saying. So what's your evil desire? Is it lying? Is it gossip? Is it pride? Is it arrogance? Do you look at things you shouldn't look at? Do you cheat on your taxes? Are you mistreating your spouse or your children? Are you impatient? Are you unloving? Do you put God as the least of your priorities when it comes to your finances, your time, your service. What is your evil desire? Because we've all got them. We've all got stuff in there that we need to put to death in our own hearts. It's so easy for us as a church to point fingers at other stuff. And this is a big issue to point fingers at without realising that, you know what, we also have our own evil desires and stuff rolling around inside of us that we need to take control over and push down as well if we are going to be faithful servants of Christ as well. Take the plank, take the log out of our own eye first. Then, once you get that log out, then, then you'll see more clearly to take the plank, the, the, the bit of wood out of some. But, but that's all then. First of all, judgment begins with the house of God. Let's get our own lives right. Now, here's the thing. I just want to throw this out here. God, I don't believe that God ever made anyone same-sex attracted. And I hear this argument. If God made me this way, then why would he be mad at me for giving in to this? Here's the thing. God never made anyone same-sex attracted. But I do believe that you could have been born same-sex attracted. I do believe that. We live in a fallen world that's been impacted by sin and sinful people. If it's possible to be born with a physical impairment that makes you different to mainstream society. If it's possible to be born with a mental impairment that makes you different from mainstream society, then why is it hard for the church to imagine that a person could be born with a desire that's different to mainstream society? We put all kinds of additives and chemicals into our system. We've done it for thousands of years. You know, I heard recently that every one of us, everyone sitting in this room, I don't want to, if you're, if you're kind of around my age or up, I don't want to freak you out or anything. You know, you've got a credit card sized piece of plastic in your body right now. Yeah. Because over a lifetime of consuming things and stuff, we've all got plastic in our, and your body can't break down plastic. Like, our bodies are not as clean and as pure and as whole as what they were when God formed Adam with the dust of the earth. We, we want the biggest, juiciest looking apple. And so they do all sorts of things to it, put all sorts of stuff in them to make them look perfect. Because when we go to a supermarket, we want things to not only be good, we want them to look good. So what do you think happens? We put chemicals and hormones and additives and all sorts of stuff in food. And generation after generation after generation, we eat this stuff and we chew on it. Well, it gets passed down to the next generation, next generation, next generation, and so on. We live in a fallen world and we haven't done everything with our own bodies that, that, that we should be doing. That's not a judgment, that's just a reality. Just a reality. There's all sorts of stuff. 
Because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. So when someone says, God made me that way, I go, no, I don't think God made you that way. But I can believe that you feel like you were born with that desire. I, do, I, I, can, I can handle that. But it doesn't make it right. And it doesn't mean that you have liberty and license to act on it. Just like I was born with certain desires. I, you know, when, I, when I was young, I loved just drinking myself stupid. Loved it. Because it covered up the pain and all the other stuff going on in my life. But as a Christ follower, is that right? No, it's not. Have a glass of wine a beer. I'm not, ju- not, not talking about that. But I'm talking about just pushing that limit and going too far and too hard all the time continuously to try to escape life and make yourself feel happy. Do I have times where I wouldn't mind doing that? Yeah. I'm human too. Do I do it? No. We need to be so aware of our own desires. So aware of those, 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 those things within us that try to cry out for our allegiance and try to pull us in their direction. We need to be aware of that stuff. We put all kinds of additives and chemicals into our systems. These things have an impact on us in many and different ways that go against God's original intention. Could you think, feel like you were born that way? Yes. But did God make you that way? No. No. No, he didn't. Number three. The truth is confession is needed. We need to confess things. We need to get things out in the open, out in the light. If you want to be free of something and you're hiding it in the dark, keeping it between you and God, thinking that God's just going to set you free, I don't think that's the biblical way that it works. Truth is, confession is needed, but grace understands that it's not always been accepted. And when it comes to same-sex attraction, especially in the church. Especially in the church. How would you respond if after our service today, somebody in the church came up to you and said that they were same-sex attracted? What if they found the courage to tell you today that they've experimented with the same sex? What would your body language tell them? What would you do with that? Or if they told you they were currently in a same-sex sexual relationship, how would you respond? We had a mate of ours in YWAM years ago. And I shared some stories with you last week. But I had this guy and he had a coming out party. Uh, it was very controversial. This was way back before same-sex sexual relationships were a big deal in society. He had a coming out party. And what he did was he got all of his Christian friends together and he held a party and he came out and told them all I'm same-sex attracted. Was it right? Was it wrong? You know what he was doing, I believe? He's a good man and he loved the Lord. He made it very, very clear, I'm same-sex attracted. This is something I'm probably going to struggle with for the rest of my life. But I'm a Christ follower, so I'm choosing to never act on it. But I want to bring it out so it's not in the dark. So that you all know. So you can pray with me and pray for me. So you can hold me accountable. So if you see me putting myself in situations because you know that's a struggle, you can come alongside and go, hey, do you think that's wise? Now, would would I have had a party and celebrated... Probably not. I have a problem with people defining themselves by their issue or their problem. You'll hear the term gay Christian being thrown out today. Now, gay Christian, the term gay Christian in most quarters of people that use that, what they mean by that is I am a same-sex attracted. I struggle with same-sex attraction, but I don't act on it. That's what they mean by gay Christian. Sometimes when we hear gay Christian, we go, how can you be a gay Christian? Because we assume that the word gay means everybody's out there acting on their impulses. That's not necessarily what they mean when they use the term gay Christian. Would I use the term gay Christian? No. No more than I'd use the term a lying Christian because I struggle with that or a a, 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 a gluttonous Christian because I eat too much or a drunkard Christian because I drink. Like, I I don't agree with defining yourself by that, but I understand what he was doing in coming out. What he was trying to say was, here I am as a Christ follower. I'm committed to following Christ. I have this struggle inside. I'm same-sex attracted. I know it's wrong, so I'm going to choose for the rest of my life to deny that thing, push it down, and to live for Jesus. Now you tell me that's not a man of God. I struggled to suppress my frustration when my kids interrupted me during a football game. <laughs> Tigers are playing! Back up! <laughs> Think about what this man's got to deal with. And he's going to deal with it for the rest of his life unless Christ sets him free. Unless God miraculously sets him free. James 5 verse 16 And then 19 to 20 says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. 
It doesn't say confess your sins to each other to get forgiveness. You confess to God, you get forgiveness, but we need to confess to one another to find a place of healing. There's something about confession to one another that opens up a doorway for healing. And I don't want to just keep getting forgiven and forgiven and forgiven and forgiven and blow it again and get forgiven and blow it again and get forgiven. And that's what happens when we have that stuff rolling around inside of us and because we're embarrassed or afraid or whatever, we don't want to talk to anyone about it. We keep it to ourselves. And everybody in this room, at some point in your life, you've done that. You don't want to talk about it because maybe people, maybe people will judge me or they'll look funny at me, whatever. So I keep this stuff on the inside, these, these desires that are, that, are, that are bad. And I just and I blow it and I say, sorry, and I'm forgiven, God loves me, but I blow it again. And I say, sorry, but I'm forgiven, God loves me. But after a while, the shame and the guilt, when part of the answer is this, go to somebody, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may start to get healing. God doesn't want to just forgive us. He wants to heal us. He wants to heal us. Confession is a part of the healing process. But what if people don't feel safe to confess? What if people don't feel safe to confess? We've gone a fraction over time. I want the band back up. I just want to finish with hallelujah. Let me just throw a couple of thoughts, random thoughts. I want to throw some random thoughts at you. And while we're singing this, I want to pray for some people this morning. And those that don't want to be prayed for or worship, there's sausages on a barbecue out there, go and feed. Just don't run off. Let's, let's, let's be a family. I want to pray for some people this morning because we've touched on some stuff in the last couple of weeks. And I'll tell you what, I had some fantastic questions from people. I've so appreciated the questions. But I know it brings up stuff for people as well. Because some of the people we're talking about, some of us have family members that are struggling with this. Some of us have sons or daughters that struggle with it. Some of us in this room, you may struggle with it. I hope and pray that it arises a safe place for you to be brutally honest, to go, hey, I struggle with that, free of judgment and criticism. We will never say it's okay. You'll never hear from the pulpit here that same-sex sexual relationships are right. You'll never hear that. But you will get grace. And you will have a community around you that will love you and pray with you and stand with you and walk with you. I think a couple of things that we can think about. Number one, I'm just throwing things. We need to re-examine the way we think about singleness in the church. I think the church does a terrible job of honouring singleness. From the time a kid's that big, we start talking about, oh, I can't wait to have grandkids. What sort of pressure do you think that puts on a younger generation? What do you think it means for somebody that's 20, 30, 40, hasn't found a life partner and sits in church and feels like, is there something wrong with me? We've painted this picture of normalised marriage like it's what everybody should do. Paul the Apostle himself says, you know what, if you, if, if you find yourself in a situation not, where you don't end up getting married, he said, this is awesome. Because you know what the married guy's got to worry about? He's got to worry about his wife. He's got to worry about his kids. He said, you people with no other, he said, you can give yourself wholly to the work of the Lord. You can love Jesus. You can serve Jesus. You can get up and go if the Lord calls you. You, you, you are in a great place. But I think as a church, we have not honoured that as a potential call. And even if it's not a call, but you find yourself in a season of life where you just don't have a a, a life partner right now. What's the Lord doing? What's he saying? How can you dive in and use that time and energy that you would serving another human being? How can you put that into serving God, giving back to your Father in heaven? I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying, I think as a church, we, 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 I, 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 I'm going to do this in a few months' time. I'm going to get some single people in the church. I want to sit down and I want to chat with them. I want to preach on how, we can be be- how, how can we better serve single people in the church. Because they feel uncomfortable sometimes. Sometimes they feel left out. We have a barbecue. We invite all married couples. But, but the single people, we just make a singles group. You guys go and hang out together. What do you think happens to the same sex attracted person who follows Christ and says but I can't give in to that desire but I actually have no desire for the opposite sex so I'm never going to be married that's a life of singleness for me I'm committing myself to a life of singleness huh? how do we help them how do we serve them think about that I can't have a family No one's ever going to call me mum or dad. Think about that. 
This is what, this is what same-sex attracted people, this is, when they choose to follow Christ and obey Christ, this is what their life is going to become like. Unless they are supernaturally set free of that same-sex attraction, this is, their, this is potentially their future. How can we as a church help? Well, again, I think we need to have a really, really good theology of the church as a family. The disciples said to Jesus, Jesus, one time, Jesus, we've left fathers and mothers and brothers, and I think it's Mark chapter 10, and lands and everything to follow you. And Jesus said to them, you know what? There's nobody that's left that behind that won't in this life and the next. He said, in this life as well, have fathers and mothers and brothers. And we are, that's that family picture of the church. We need to bring single people into our families. Let them feel like an uncle or an auntie to our kids. Let them feel like a brother or sister. Little things we can do better. That's just a couple of free thoughts. You don't have to pay a tithe or anything for that one. I'm I'm just throwing that out there. We're going to sing this song. We're going to eat. But if you feel like the Lord's been stirring in your heart, I don't, I don't know what it is. I just feel this morning, I just want to kind of tie a bow around this particular topic and pray. Maybe you're being challenged. Maybe, maybe, you, are, maybe you struggle with that. That's okay. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you've got family members or friends and you're now processing, going, okay, I think I can see what's right and wrong, but how do I walk forward into that now? I had a guy come up to me last week after the service and he said to me, I've never seen... I, this is the first time I've seen that same-sex sexual relationships are wrong. I've never seen it before. Now I've seen it clearly in the Word of God. Now he's got to work that out. So anyway, we'd like to just open up the front this morning. Anybody that would like prayer, we'd love to pray with you this morning. We'd love to pray with you this morning. I hope that what I've said today has come across with a lot of grace. I hope it's come across with grace. Again, like last week, if you have questions or concerns about stuff I said, please contact me. I'm happy to chat with you and clarify whatever I need to do. Amen? Amen. And we stand to our feet. Feel free, guys. We've gone a fair bit over what we normally do today. So if you're a visitor, we don't normally go this long, but I just want to make sure we get this nice and clear. If you want to move next door and start having some sausages and that, I'm sure it's already out there. We're going to worship here. And if you'd like prayer, just invite you to come on forward. We'll get the leaders to come and... Lay hands and pray for you. If you don't want to come forward to get prayed for, ask someone next to you, hey, would you pray with me? That's completely fine too. God answers their prayers as well. Amen.